It is now time for a question period. The Minister from Simcoe Gray. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I seek consent to stand down the uh, PC lead questions until the fifth PC rotation. So we will stand down the rotation. I don't, do not believe it's unanimous consent. It's basically just information for us. So oh, we do need consent. Sorry. All right. I've been schooled again. We do need consent. Do we agree? Agreed. Agreed. Yes. Agreed. Okay. That shows you when this pen question is on. I'm sorry. Um, We're just waiting for that bathroom. Yeah. Uh, well, the reality is, is I heard some heckling, and I wasn't sure if it was a yes. Uh, do we have agreement? Agreed. Agreed. The leader of the third party on uh, questions. Thank you, Speaker. My question is uh, for the Premier. Yesterday, Dave Nicol, the bureaucrat responsible for government record keeping, said that he knew the government's own security branch was investigating the possibility that Liberal staff had been illegally wiping computers. When did the Premier learn that her own government was investigating deliver, uh, deleted hard drive, Speaker? Premier. So, um, Mr. Speaker, as I have said many times uh, in this uh, in this House. Uh, I learned the allegations against the uh, former Premier's Chief of Staff on March 27th when uh, those became public. There is, a, there is an investigation ongoing, Mr. Speaker. I do not have the details of that investigation, Mr. Speaker. I will not, uh, I will not interfere with uh, that investigation, Mr. Speaker, and I really believe that we need to let that investigation uh, roll out, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, the Premier has now repeated again that she was as shocked as anyone when the allegation of breach of trust uh, broke out on March 27th. The Premier knew, however, that there were multiple investigations happening and knew they were affecting her offices. The Premier said she was as surprised as anyone, uh, but what Order, exactly please. did the Premier think the police were looking for? Thank you. Well, the again, Minister of Rural Affairs will come to order. Again, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I did. I learned of the allegations on March 27th. That is absolutely true, Mr. Speaker. Like everyone else, um, the uh, the investigation is ongoing. I am I am not uh, I'm not going to interfere with that investigation, Mr. Speaker. And nor um, nor do I have the details of that investigation. And that's as it should be, Mr. Speaker. So what I what I did when I came into this office, as I have said to the uh, member opposite. As I opened up the process, I made it clear that there were questions that had been asked that needed answers, that there were documents that uh, needed to be provided to committee. The scope of the committee was expanded. We have provided those hundreds of thousands of pages of documents, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I have appeared before the committee twice, and there have been dozens answer. of people who have be appeared before that committee and have answered the questions that the committee has asked. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, I'm asking specifically about when the Premier knew that there were investigations going on in her offices. Of 22 staff who had their computers wiped, nine of those people are still Liberal staffers. Three of them are in the Premier's office. One works for her in agriculture and food. Two of them have been promoted to chief of staff roles. The government has been seized with this scandal for over a year, Speaker, but the Premier seems to be saying she was as surprised as anyone when the news broke on the 27th of March. Is the Premier saying that none of her staff ever told her about this? Premier. Mr. Speaker, you know, it was common knowledge that there was an investigation into questions about record keeping. We had, uh, we had conversations with the Information Privacy Commissioner. The rules were changed as a result of conversations with the Information Privacy Commissioner. So, Mr. Speaker, we knew that uh, the the Privacy Commissioner was looking into this last spring. The, the OPP investigation was known about last June. That was common knowledge. The allegations, the recent allegations, I first knew about on March 27th because I am not interfering in the uh, investigation, Mr. Speaker. It is ongoing. It was known that it was in place, and it will continue to roll out. And I will continue not to interfere in that investigation, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. My next question is also for the Premier Speaker. Yesterday, media reports indicated that the OPP are still hoping to talk to a number of individuals, including Dalton McGuinty, the man whose legacy the Premier is sworn to uphold. Does the Premier think that Dalton McGuinty should agree to be interviewed by the OPP anti-racket subgroup? 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, the, end of, the investigation is ongoing. The, uh, the investigation will, will include uh, people as the uh, individuals leading it choose, Mr. Speaker. I have no control over that. And as the leader of the third party knows, Mr. Speaker, uh, the former Premier Dalton McGuinty has appeared twice before the committee. I have appeared twice before the committee, Mr. Speaker. I have done everything in my power to make sure that as questions have been asked, that they have been answered, and I will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. Well, Speaker, I was asking about the OPP investigation. You know, it's not just Dalton McGuinty. The report indicates that the OPP is hoping to talk to several key Liberals, including the former Chief of Staff and his deputies. At committee, the OPP indicated that some of those folks have declined to do so. Does the Premier think they should talk to police, Speaker? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I, you know, I think that the leader of the third party knows full well that uh, I do not have control over every person who might be asked to uh, come before a committee. I know, Mr. Speaker, that there have been there have been people who have been asked to come before the committee uh, who were former uh, PC candidates, for example, and they have not shown up, Mr. Speaker. So I think individuals make their decisions, Mr. Speaker. My decision, my decision was to appear before the committee twice, Mr. Speaker. We have done everything in our power to cooperate with. Uh, with uh, the people who are asking questions and make sure that they get those answers. We have done that repeatedly. We will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Sir, I'm talking about the OPP anti-racket squad request to speak to people. The Premier says this is an open and accountable government that respects the value of taxpayers' dollars, but all people see, Speaker, are Liberals avoiding accountability and a Premier scrambling to dis distance herself from the legacy of Dalton McGuinty. Can the Premier answer a very simple question, Speaker? Order. As leader of the Liberal Party, will she urge all fellow Liberals to cooperate fully with the OPP investigation? So, Mr. Speaker, I have been clear. This is an investigation over which I have no control. I am not interfering with the investigation, Mr. Speaker. It is up to the OPP, who are directing the investigation, to continue to do that. I will continue, Mr. Speaker, to, uh, to not in interfere in that, Mr. Speaker, and I will continue as we are asked questions. As the committee uh, does its business, we will continue to cooperate in every way, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, and uh, good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, when the people of Ontario heard about these wiped computers in your office, they were furious. They knew it all along. They felt it in their bones, Order. and now the OPP are hot on the trail. If somebody dropped this in my lap without warning, I'd be apoplectic. I'd come out swinging. Your reaction? You're concerned. If you really didn't know anything, why, were, why weren't you furious with these people and demand answers from them? The only people you seem to be mad at are the PCs, the very people who are exposing your scandal. So instead of fighting to get to the truth, you're fighting to keep the truth from coming out. That's not what people expect from a premier. They want someone who will fight for Question. them, not someone who's fighting against them. Premier, why are you fighting against the truth coming out? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see this, please? You see this? Premier? Mr. Speaker, I know that the, um, the government House Leader is going to want to comment on the, uh, the latest details around the committee, but I just, I just want to say this. I really believe that it is my responsibility as the Premier and the leader of this party, Mr. Speaker. It's my responsibility as the leader of this government to make sure that uh, over-the-top rhetoric is not part of my modus operandi, Mr. Speaker. That what I, what I have a responsibility to do is to make sure that as questions are asked, that we answer them. If there's a process that needs to be changed, Mr. Speaker, that we change that process. If there are rules that need to be changed, then we change those rules. And that's exactly what we've been doing, Mr. Speaker. My responsibility is to take action to make sure that as we go forward, mistakes that were made are not made again, Mr. Speaker, and that we ensure that we have all of the Answer. information that is asked for made available. That's my responsibility, Mr. Speaker.
Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Premier, many in our caucus have spent a lot of time getting to the bottom yeah. of your gas plant scandal. We've all seen the systematic attempts Order. to keep us from getting the truth out. You say you brought in the Auditor General, but that's only after the Liberals blocked us from doing it. Yeah. You say you weren't involved in the Oakville scandal, yet we found your signature on the documents that kick-started this whole scheme. You say you weren't involved in Mississauga, but you co-chaired the campaign when it was cancelled. Oh. Premier, those steady hands of yours have left a lot of fingerprints on, this, on the gas plant scandal. Does the committee have to call you in a third time to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I listened, I listened very, very carefully to the member from Nipissing's question, and he seemed to leave out the fact that his party made the exact same exact. promise in the last election. He forgot to mention that his leader posted a video on YouTube saying if he was elected Premier, the gas plant would be done, done, done. Mr. Speaker, he forgot to mention the fact that when we asked progressive conservative candidates to come forward to the committee to talk about, well, the policy analysis they had done, the costing they had done to ask the same questions they're asking. Mr. Speaker, they miraculously couldn't appear, Mr. Speaker, despite the fact one even said she would appear. She surprisingly at the last minute said, oh, no, I can't, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, you know, please, Mr. Speaker, it's a little rich for them to be standing up to talk about getting to the bottom, but the fact of the matter is that there are all inconvenient facts that they leave. Thank you. New question, the member from Timmins, James Bay. My question is to the Premier. Premier, long before your date of March 27th, when you say you first found out about this, government services had a forensic investigation of the deleted emails and the deleted hard drives in the Premier's office. And on September 5th, they had Minister identified the that 24 order. hard drives in the Premier's office had been deleted. Did the Premier ever discuss with your Minister of Government Services that investigation? Premier. Minister of Government Services. Minister of Government Services. Mr. Speaker, uh, again, I would direct the honourable member. I would direct all honourable members to the document that was made public uh, by the court proceedings or through the court Stephen proceedings Lewis about two weeks ago, Mr. Questions. Speaker, and that uh, uh, clearly references the reporter investigation that he's talking about as part of the OPP investigation. I can inform the honourable member as Minister of Government Services. I had a discussion with my I deputy early on where I indicated. Policy. To him, that any interaction between my ministry and the OPP that I did not wish to know anything about it, to be briefed on it, to be in any way connected, Mr. Speaker, because I wanted to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that it was fully independent. And I am That's pleased to Justice say, Mr. Lyndon Speaker, said. that the deputy and uh, members of my ministry respected that, and I was given no information Answer. about any work uh, being undertaken by the Ministry of Government Services. And again, Mr. Speaker, let's let the OPP continue their work. Supplementary. That is an unbelievable answer to the question. Nine of the 22 staff premier whose computers were wiped are still Liberal staffers. Three of them still work in your office, and one works daily with the government house leader who used to work in the premier's office. So my question to you, to the government services minister, did you raise yes or no this issue before the, uh, before the date that the premier said directly with her? Mr. Speaker. You know, I, I, again, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure where the New Democrats have been uh, for the last year or so. In June, uh, I have, a, I have a, uh, an article here from June 7, 2013, which outlines uh, the news that the OPP is conducting an investigation into this matter. That was a matter of, uh, of public record, Mr. Speaker, now going on uh, uh, close to a year. As I just indicated, Mr. Speaker, I felt the prudent course uh, as minister was that uh, I in no way be involved or have knowledge of the OPP investigation because, Mr. Speaker, unlike members of the opposition, I respect the independence of the NDP. And, Mr. Speaker, I'm also aware, as the OPP, OPP. OPP 
Uh, I correct my record, Mr. Speaker. As the OPP, I also respect the independence of the NDP, Mr. Speaker. But as the Answer. OPP indicated, interference by politicians, Mr. Speaker, could in fact Thank jeopardize you. the investigation. Thank you. A new question, the member from Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Minister, as you know, today is the International Day of Pink. The Day of Pink is an anti-bullying initiative which began in Nova Scotia after a grade 9 student who was bullied in the school for wearing pink. Two students who witnessed the incident brought pink shirts to fight against bullying and stand with the students. Now, young people across Canada, including schools in my riding of Scarborough Agent Court, are wearing pink today to draw the attention to the harmful effects of bullying. This demonstrates the importance of speaking up against the form of discrimination and homophobia. It also demonstrates that together we can stop bullying and end discrimination, particularly in our schools. Speaker, through you to the minister, can she please inform the House why it's so important that our schools are welcoming and safe places for Ontario students? Thank you, Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member for Scarborough Agent Court for her question, because it is so important. That that we all take a stand and say we will not accept bullying in our schools. And you know, as the chair of the Safe Schools Action Team and a Minister of Education, I've visited schools all across the province that are taking a stand against bullying. And I think of one school I visited in Guelph, actually, uh, and visited with, with the students in the Gay Straight Alliance, the GSA, at this school. And they told me about one of the things that they thought had had the great greatest impact that they had done was that they had arranged to meet with the staff in the staff cafeteria and actually had a very open conversation with the staff about things the staff could do differently in the school uh, to create a better atmosphere for gay and lesbian students. Another student told me that she wasn't gay. She wasn't lesbian, but the, the GSA had Thank supported you. her in her bullying situation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, initiatives like the International Day of Pink shows that our young people want to stand up to bullying. But we know that bullying doesn't just happen in our classroom, Mr. No. Speaker. It occurs on internet, on websites like Facebook and Twitter. We also know there have been tragic incidents of young people taking their lives because of bullying they have received in the classroom and online. Speaker, through you to the minister, can she inform the House what our government is doing to combat bullying outside the classroom? Good question. Good. Minister? And the, uh, the member is absolutely correct. Bullying actually often does occur outside the school, which is why, for the first time in Ontario, we have recognized cyberbullying in legislation and included cyberbullying as part of the definition of bullying. We've also given principals the authority to take action when there is, negative, when there is bullying that takes place online that has a negative impact on the school. And I think of one school that I visited here in Toronto that actually took the action uh, beyond just looking at the students' cyberbullying. They actually set up an email line where kids could report bullying online. And the vice principal monitored that, and the school was able to set up uh, workshops for the Sir. kids about homophobia or about racism or about ethnic discrimination and deal with all sorts of facets as a whole school Thank community you. and reduce bullying. Thank you. New question, the member for Lynn for Nicholson. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Premier, since you were appointed by the Liberal Party a year ago, you've talked a lot about running an open government and wanting to engage in a lot of conversations. This makes your recent behaviour hard to explain. A few weeks ago, your House leader accused my colleague, the member from Nipissing, of divulging confidential documents to the public. It wasn't true. That was quickly exposed as nothing but a ploy to cover up your own incompetence and distract attention from your scandals. Premier, you're at it again. Your attempts at intimidation against our leader, Tim Hudak, and the member from Nepean and Carlton are unwarranted and undemocratic. It is our job as the official opposition to question and hold your scandal-plagued government to account. Here, here. Will you drop the charade today and get on with the task of providing Ontarians some hope? Question. If you won't, we'll be glad to do it. Here, here. You see please? You see me, please? Thank you. I, uh, before I go to the Premier, 
I am going to offer advice to all members that we uh, should not be tiptoeing around unparliamentary language uh, uh, to the best of our ability. That if it gets there, I'll let you know. Premier. Yes, leader. He wasn't tiptoeing. You know, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we all recognize Check the fact that uh, this is a time for debate, this is a time for uh, discussion, Mr. Speaker, but at the same time, all of us inside the House and outside the House, Mr. Speaker, have to stick to the facts. I've, I've shared quotes before, Mr. Speaker. I have a new one from the Ottawa Citizen, I believe it's today, April 9th. Quote, the Tories seem to have no real theory of what happened. The idea may be to fling as much muck as possible and hope is. Ontarians blame Kathleen Wynne for something. The fact is, Mr. Speaker, we need to be dealing with facts, and I am pleased, Mr. Speaker, I am proud that the Premier has consulted her lawyers in this. As I noted a number of times, Mr. Speaker, the member from Nepean Carlton is familiar with this situation. It was not that long ago, Mr. Speaker, that she, as a result of a lawsuit, had to retract something that she had written, Mr. Speaker, that. and that's all we ask, Mr. Speaker. Deal with the facts and apologize and withdraw those things that are not. Thank you. Supplementary. To the Premier. Premier, through the information to obtain and the Justice Committee, we've learned a lot about how your party made the decision Order. to cancel the gas plants and the efforts made by Liberal operatives to systematically destroy the evidence. We have reason to believe that the wrongdoing occurred at the highest level of your McGinty Wynn government. Mm -hmm. There is much to be uncovered, and despite your efforts, we're going to keep asking the questions that you don't want answers here, to. Here. Premier, is it not true that the reason you initiated this frivolous action is because you know the OPP's investigation could still take some time, and you're afraid of other embarrassing revelations coming out prior to a potential spring election? I'll ask you again. Will you drop this today and let us get on with the jobs we've all been sent here to do? Here, here. Mr. Mr. Speaker, again, I remember Tony we're asking Clement's people suit. to deal with the facts, and you know, I know, I know, everyone in the House likes when I do this. Let's let's tell you the reviews are in. Let's share some of them. Yeah. Toronto Star, April 1st. The leader of the opposition went far beyond what the facts show. Sorry. Toronto Star again, April 1st. The leader of the opposition is inventing <laughs> fanciful scenarios about the first days of Wynne's premiership. Ottawa Citizen, April 1st. The PCs asked repeatedly whether Wynne's computer was among those wiped, which makes little sense. The police are crystal clear that they're interested in exactly. computers in McGinty's office where Wynne did not work. Global Mail editorial, April 1st. Ontario Progressive Conservative leader is on thin legal ice. Global Mail editorial goes on to say the leader of the opposition's claim that Premier Wynne was personally behind any wiping of government computers when there's Answer. no evidence to support such Don't an allegation comment. goes too far. Mr. Speaker, let's Thank deal you. with the facts, and they're not. They're going to hear Thank from you. the Premier's law. Thank you. Your question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Energy. The CEO of Bruce Power is front and centre in today's newspapers, calling on the government to sell off more of our electricity system to private operators, specifically him. Is that the government's plan? Mr. Oh. Energy. Mr. Speaker, many of us here in this uh, chamber know Duncan Hawthorne quite well, and uh, he has a very distinctive way of communicating, Mr. Speaker. Uh, however, he also is an entrepreneur, Mr. Speaker, and he's going to do whatever he can to generate benefits to his shareholders, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the government is not currently looking uh, at uh, disposing of any of our energy uh, companies, Mr. Speaker. Our updated long-term energy plan sets out the refurbishment schedule, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, for Bruce's uh, units and for OPG's units. And Mr. Speaker, there's an unbelievable level of cooperation now between OPG and Bruce Power on how they can generate efficiencies in moving forward with that significant project, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, families who are stuck paying the highest hydro bills in Canada get a little anxious when they hear Liberal and private power deal in the same sentence. It's been clear for some time that the folks at Bruce Power and TransCanada, TransCanada, who did very well out of the gas plant scandal, by the way, are hoping to create a yep. private monopoly in nuclear power. Will the minister take that idea off the table? 
Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to work to generate efficiencies in the electricity system, whether we're partnering with the private sector or other public entities, Mr. Speaker. But he raises the question of electricity prices. As I've said uh, other days in this legislature, Mr. Speaker, when you look at the comparative numbers from a third-party independent Quebec Hydro, the price in Ottawa is 12.39 cents per kilowatt hour. Yeah. Toronto, 12.48 cents. Edmonton, 13.9 cents. Calgary, 14.8 cents. Halifax, 15.45 cents. And if you want to look at the U.S. comparison, which the other party looks at frequently, Detroit is 15.54, Boston, 16.50, New York, 21.75. We are competitive, and we're not going to listen to your BS. Thank you. Your question, the member from Glengarry Prescott Russell. Thank you and good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. As our government. Excuse me. There's no, no, no point of ours. Just stop. Order. The member from Glengarry Prescott Russell. New Thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you again, and uh, good morning. My question is to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. As our government transforms Ontario's transportation network, it is crucial that we ensure that we bring new economic opportunities to each and every part of this province. This is important to me as I represent a rural community, Glengarry, Prescott and Russell. Speaker, on Friday, the Minister made an announcement in North Bay on the future of the ONTC. And yesterday, Speaker, the member from Temiskaming Cochrane asked the minister to clarify our plan forward on the ONTC. However, Speaker, I believe the member appeared to need some clarification on some of the major facts regarding the ONTC. Speaker, through you to the minister, how is our government delivering transit solutions and providing certainty for communities in northeastern Ontario? Sir, Northern Development and Mines. Speaker, I want to thank the member for Glenn Gary Prescott Russell for the, for the uh, question and an opportunity to clarify some important facts that were maybe sent out incorrectly yesterday. Um, I do think it's fair to say that all members recognize that uh, there have been tremendous changes in the telecommunications industry. And from our perspective, I think it probably will be shared by many that it doesn't make a great deal of sense for a government to uh, to continue to run a telecommunications company that's in uh, competition, direct competition with the private sector. So indeed, we have. Uh, reached a uh, purchase agreement with Bell Alliance to uh, purchase Ontario, and then to inform the member opposite, an important point, I mean, Ontario has been losing money for over the past decade in terms of their uh, costs exceeding the revenues, and this particular purchase agreement with Bell Alliance will give the province value within three years, so Bell is better positioned, Mr. Speaker, to attract industry partners, invest in capital, we're going to continue to uh, make sure services are provided to uh, communities in Iroquois Falls, Tomogamy, Martin, River, Tilda Lake, Moose City, and Moose Factory, and all Frank. Thank you. Services. Supplementary. Thank you again, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that uh, clarification. It's obvious that the Minister is taking the needed action to find a sustainable solution for the ONTC while providing certainty for northeastern Ontario residents. Speaker, the Minister mentioned funding to the ONTC on core transportation services for northeastern Ontario. And we all know that providing investments on transportation services and infrastructure assets uh, in economic growth and benefits many sectors. Speaker, can the Minister tell us of the new strategic investments that are being made to improve the ONTC's transportation service and infrastructure and the economic benefits that we can expect? Minister. Well, Thank you so much, Speaker. And there's no question about it that with some very necessary improvements, a continued transformation of the ONTC, uh, a sustainable and a bright future is very, very much uh, in, uh, impossible for the ONTC. And I do think that the decisions that were made and the recommendations that came from the Ministerial Advisory Committee, in particular, uh, uh, determined that focusing on core transportation services was absolutely crucial. We will continue to operate motor coach, uh, the bus service, Polar Bear Express, freight rail, and refurbishment services. They will be staying in. Public hands. $23.2 million investment added on to that, Mr. Speaker, over three years to, uh, to improve service and the accessibility of uh, motor coach services. We're purchasing 11 uh, new buses and to uh, refurbish passenger coaches for the uh, Polar Bear Express. We're making real improvements and providing a bright future. And by reaching this decision, Speaker, we are also providing much That's needed her. certainty to the uh, future of the ONC. Transforming the ONTC is part of uh, our plan to ensure a prosperous, Regional economy that attracts more people and more investment in Northern Ontario.
I uh, want to bring some clarity to an issue. Uh, the member from uh, Toronto Danforth stood on a point of order. We do not uh, traditionally and conventionally entertain points of order uh, during question period, but we will entertain them after. There was a purpose and a reason for his point of order, and uh, it goes back to what I have been exercising, and that is to try to listen carefully to what people say in the House. And regrettably, uh, I would ask the member from Lambton Kent Middlesex not to intervene. And I uh, do not always hear things that are said in the House because of the heckling and because of the volume of noise. And if any member wishes to stand and withdraw or correct the record, I would ask all honourable members to do so. If anyone said anything that they should not have. <laughs> Mr. Energy. I withdraw the comment that I made, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question. This is uh, this is for clarity's sake the lead question. That's right. The member from Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Speaker, the criminal investigations that are reaching into the offices of the Premier and Ministers in this uh, government will ultimately expose the pervasive corruption of this government. While the focus to date has been on the Premier's office and on ministers and on political staff, it appears now that civil servants have been co-opted into highly unethical conduct as well. And that's precisely what's taking place in the Ministry of Health. Can the minister tell us why Assistant Deputy Minister Patricia Lee and new head of the Air Ambulance Oversight Richard Jackson would direct ministry staff to alter a letter to say that the Ministry of Health did not have Question. a copy of the Forensic Investigation Team's audit report on Orange when they both knew that there were copies in the ministry at that time? Thank you. Stop the clock, please. Stop the clock, please. Stop the clock, please. Um, as I did listen carefully, I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. Withdraw. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Speaker, what I can say to uh, the member opposite is that uh, Orange has been under a lot of scrutiny, and as the member knows, the committee has been meeting for a long time. We have legislation before the House, Speaker, uh, Bill 11, that would complete the work that uh, needs to be done to bring the appropriate oversight to, uh, to Orange. Uh, in terms of the specific question that the member has asked, I, uh, I will undertake to uh, look into, into that allegation, Speaker. Uh, it is certainly not uh, behaviour that I am aware of, nor would I condone. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, apparently some emails survived this government's cleansing. Oh. Here is an email trail that was gleaned from a dump of emails to the Public Accounts Committee just last week. In the first email, Charles Meehan of the Ministry of Health wrote the following. The only edit Minister of is a the sentence Environment, second added time. after the discussions with Patricia Lee. This is an email sent to the solicitor at the Attorney General responsible for the Ministry of Health. The edit, he says, is intended to clarify that the Ministry of Health does not have a copy of the report and that no staff in the ministry have read or accessed the report. Here was the response from Paul Kaufman in the Ministry of the Attorney General. Question. He said, and I quote, I don't know how we can say this. My understanding is that the ministry does have possession, so the statement is not true. Whoa. Can the minister tell us why Thank is you. her secret staff directing Thank you. Thank you. I will, uh, I will re remind the member when I say thank you, that's the end of your time for question, and when I stand up, you sit down, so stop, please. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Uh, well, Speaker, it appears to me that the emails make it clear that they corrected uh, when they found an error, Speaker. Uh, as I said, I will look into this issue. What I can tell you is that uh, progress at Orange is significant. Under the new leadership of Ian Delaney, uh, and uh, 
in the, the CEO, Dr. Andrew McCallum, we have seen a remarkable improvement in the quality of care. And I think the member opposite would agree that under the new leadership and the volunteer board at Orange, we have seen significant improvements. Uh, Speaker, Orange is into a new chapter. The right changes are being made and have been made, and I look forward to discussing that more. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. A new question. The member from Newmarket, Aurora. I'm talking about the Ministry of Health. I'm talking about the Assistant Deputy Minister who has oversight responsibility of, uh, of Orange. She is the one who directed staff in her own ministry to falsify a statement regarding a matter taking place in the Ministry of Health. That is what happened. I'd like to know this, because 11 months after that record was changed at the direction of the Assistant Deputy Minister, the minister herself testified that there were no copies of that record because they had forwarded directly to the OPP. I want to know from this minister, what can we rely on to be the truth that we've heard from her or any of her civil servants on this file? I, uh, I correct my record. It was the final supplementary. Minister. Well, thank you, Speaker. And uh, I think those of us who are paying attention to what the member from Newmarket Aurora has uh, has done in the past, we would we would all have confidence in knowing that he might not have the whole story. Yeah. Speaker, he has a remarkably consistent track record in bringing forward just part of the story. What I can tell you is that Paul Kaufman is our ministry lawyer speaker. He, uh, he, he noticed that an error had been made and corrected that error. Very so good. thank you, Speaker. The new question, member from New Market uh, You know, I'm going to direct this to the Premier. I'd like to know from the Premier if she sees a contradiction here, because we certainly do. On the one hand, the Premier professes a new era of open and accountable government, and yet she's just observed her own Minister of Health sidestepping a very direct question about the conduct of her Assistant Deputy Minister. She now stands up in her place and tells me that I have the facts wrong. I have emails that say very clearly what happened, and even after Mr. Kaufman alerted the fact that this is not true. Guess what? Her own civil service under Mr. Richard Jackson came back and said, well, let's word it this way. Mr. Kaufman came back and said, no, it's still not true. And I'm asking the Premier this. Question. Who can we believe in your government? You have civil servants now that are not telling the truth. Your minister stands up for them. Where is your transparency? Where is your accountability? And what is your definition of truth? Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Well, Speaker, as I said in the original question, I will certainly look into the allegations raised by the Market Aurora. I can also say that he has raised many questions in this House, has made other allegations in this House. And every time I follow up on We're them, as I Lampton, undertake Kent, to do, to and almost without exception, yep. he gets his facts wrong. So I will happily look into this allegation as well. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, that's very interesting, Speaker, because the first time I raised concerns about Orange, the minister deflected it, and guess what? There's now a criminal investigation into that organization. I'd like to back to the Premier. On the one hand, Speaker, the Premier is asking us to support anti slap legislation in this place. That's before the now. <coughs> and yet the Premier is carrying on in the tradition of Dalton McGuinty oh. to sue the very people who are bringing forward facts that should be examined by this legislature. Can the, the Premier the tell me this? How does she square? bringing anti-slap legislation before this legislation and herself lay lawsuits against the member, the uh, leader that of the question? opposition, the member from Nepean Carlton, to in fact ensure that the real issues are not dealt with. How does she square that? Thank you. 
Thank you. The uh, member from Durham come to order. The member from Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Se well, actually, maybe even third time. Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Speaker. I, I believe that was supposed to have been a supplementary. Uh, um, I'm not sure that it had anything to do with the first question. Uh, so what I can repeat, Speaker, is I will look into these allegations, as I have always looked into the allegations raised in this House by the member from Newmark Roar and by others, and I will uh, uh, happily report back on what I find, Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. The fact of the matter is my question was not to the Minister of Health. It was a very direct question to the Premier about how she can square how she can square sitting there listening to her Minister of Health avoid the truth when in fact she's committed to transparency. I'm going to ask the Premier one more time. I, uh, I have been listening very carefully. Please, uh, please withdraw, and, and let's not weave in and out of this. Just withdraw and then ask your question. I'll withdraw, and I'll ask the Premier a very straightforward question. You know, I asked her defi to define how she considers truth. What is her definition of truth? I asked her that question. She, she refused to answer that. Well, the people in this province are very confused about that as well. And what she has chosen to do is to refer the matter to the courts. And I'm going to suggest Question. that I believe in the end it will be a court that makes a decision about this government. It will be the court of public opinion. And the court of public opinion Minister of Health, Long Term Care. To the Premier, Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. And I, you know, it's. Uh, I'm happy to. Uh, I'm happy to answer the uh, the question of the member opposite. Uh, I had referred the first question because it was a health question, and then the question changed. So let me just say this, Mr. Speaker. What I believe is in the best interest of the politics of this province and the uh, the political discourse and serving the people of the province is that we deal with facts mr speaker the only reason the only reason that i have challenged the allegations and the accusations of the leader of the opposition is that they are not based in fact mr speaker otherwise i would be happy to continue to discuss the issues around the placement of energy infrastructure the rules we have changed around the retention of documents mr speaker but i will not i will not debate I will not debate allegations that are completely false, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. You see the case? You see the case? New question? The member from the Lake Lakeshore. Um, Mr. Speaker, my, my question is to the Premier. Excuse me. Stop the clock, please. I. Uh, uh, how, how this place works is to come to order when the speaker asks. And I'm going to ask the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke to come to order. New question. The, member, the, the minister responsible for seniors can hide his face all he wants. I'm not impressed. Think about this. The member from Etobicoke Lake Shore. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, just about every day there's questions on the gas plant. Yep. And just about every day you deflect some of the questions off to your House Leader. And just about every day the House Leader tries to implicate the rest of the House in the decision made by your Liberal government by saying that everyone was a party to wanting to get the gas plants taken down. Now this might even be true. This might be true. But the mistake, Premier, was putting them there in the first place. And I think it's high time that you quit sidestepping responsibility for blowing $1.1 billion of tax dollars and get the House Leader to admit the fact that it was putting them up in the first place that caused the problem. When are you going to do that? Thank you. You see it? You see it, please?
Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I, uh, I just want to. Uh, uh, remark that it's uh, it's great that the member for Etobicoke Lakeshore has paid very close attention to the answers that uh, that we've been giving because it's very clear that this was uh, a decision that all of the parties had taken Mr. Speaker that all of the parties had decided and we implemented the promise that they had made Mr. Speaker Mr. Speaker the fact is that it was the, uh, the Liberal government that built those plants in the wrong place in the, f in the first instance and wasted $1.1 billion. They also could have rectified the problem without spending all that money if they had just taken some time and done it in the proper way. But they were so concerned about getting on with an election, they didn't care about tax dollars. I want to know when are we going to get some accountability from your government and when are you going to si quit sidestepping responsibility? Thank you. You see the first? You see the first? Thank you. Premier? Peter. This is a little fair. Mr. Speaker, I Thank you, Doug. I know I have I have a whole binder of quotes here, Mr. Speaker. And once we go through Hansard, I think I'll be able to add some more. But, Mr. Speaker, don't believe me, Mr. Speaker. This is the document that the OPP filed with the courts. You'll want to hear it. In September 2011, a provincial election campaign began, and the Liberal Party, this is the OPP, Mr. Speaker, and the Liberal Party of Ontario promised to cancel the construction of the plant in Mississauga if they were elected. The Ontario Progressive Conservatives of the New Caledon Democratic come to order. Party also made similar promises if elected. On the 6th of October, the Liberal Party won the provincial election and formed a minority government. Even though they made the same promise during the election, the opposing New question. The leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My uh, question is to the Premier. This week, we learned of yet another tragic death in an Ontario mine. 36-year-old Paul Rochette, a millwright with two young children, was killed on Sunday in Valet's Copper Cliff Smelter. It's been 30 years since a provincial commission investigated mine safety. Since then, scores of miners in Ontario have been killed and thousands of others have been injured. Last year, the Premier rejected a public inquiry into mine safety and instead chose a review. But at the very first of public hearings in Timmins and Kirkland Lake, the government didn't advertise or even put out so much as a press release or media advisory to invite participants. Does the Premier think this is acceptable, Speaker? Minister of Labour. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member for this question. I think all of us in the House were saddened to hear of this, uh, of this incident, and I know yeah, yeah. that our thoughts are with the worker his family and his colleagues. As this um, investigation specifically is ongoing, it would be inappropriate for me to uh, comment on the specifics of this issue. But what I will tell you is that this government is committed to protecting the health and safety yeah, of yeah. miners and yeah, all yeah. workers in the province of Ontario. We know and we agree that it's time to thoroughly take a long look at mine safety in this province. The Chief Prevention Officer for the Province of Ontario has undertaken a comprehensive mining safety review. We have an industry advisory group with industry, with labour, with health and safety representatives, and we are going to continue this review because what we know is that we need to improve mine safety. Thank you. We need to make it even here, safer here, here. Thank in you. the Province of Ontario. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, talking the right words is simply not good enough. On April 28, the day of mourning for injured workers, MPPs across this province attend ceremonies to remember those who are killed or injured on the job. As elective representatives, we need to do everything in our power to end workplace deaths and injuries. The Premier refuses to conduct an inquiry. Will she commit today that the government review panel into mining safety will have the resources necessary to conduct 
numerous site visits to mining operations, both below ground and above ground, and advertise them with vigour. And it would be nice if the Liberal caucus over there paid attention to this question, because people are dying on the job in Ontario, and they should be doing something about it. Yes, Seated, please. Seated, please. Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, I would like the House to know that the review was under has been underway for some time. It was underway before this incident took place, and it's going to continue. Ontario's Chief Prevention Officer has undertaken that that uh, that review with an advisory group that's that's uh, composed comprised of industry reps, labour reps and health and safety reps. Public consultations are being held right now. They've already been to Timmins, Kirkland Lake, Sudbury. They're going on to, uh, to Marathon and London in the future. I'm encouraging all Ontarians that are interested in this very important issue to register, attend these sessions, provide their comments as to how we can make mine safety an important issue in this province that needs to obviously Absolutely. have some more attention Answer. that we need to improve safety. We can make it even safer, I believe, Speaker, if we all work together. Yeah, yeah. We get all Thank viewpoints you. on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Question the minute from Mississauga Brant himself. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. We were to have a very special visitor with us in the House today. Unfortunately, he has been able to join us, but I would like to tell all of you a little bit about him. Eleven years ago, at the age of 65, Morf Shafford became the oldest lung transplant recipient in the history of Toronto General Hospitals program. Since then, he has been working tirelessly with waitlisted patients, recipients, and families to help them understand the transplant process. Murph's selfless work is an inspiration to me and others across this province. It also reminds us of the importance of organ donation. April is Be a Donor Month. The Trillium Gift of Life Network is working with its partners to encourage Ontarians to register to be an organ and tissue donors. My question for the minister is question. how we can best follow Murph's example and we each do our part to encourage more Ontarians to help save lives. Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the very fine member from uh, Mississauga, Brampton South, for that question. And I want to join the member for in thanking Merv Shepherd for all the work that he has done. I know that he's recently been recognized by the Trillion Gift of Life Network's Board of Directors for his tireless dedication to raising awareness about organ and tissue donation and transplantation. And I know all members in the House uh, join me in congratulating him. Speaker, social media can be a very effective tool, particularly when it comes to reaching out to younger people, and that's why TGLN has been very active on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, to encourage more people to register their content to donate their organs. Today is Trillion Gift of Life Network's MPP Twitter Day. I want everyone in the House today to join me in tweeting their support of organ and tissue donation. Here's my tweet. It takes two minutes to save eight lives. Register to be an organ Answer. donor now at beadonor.ca. Hashtag be a donor. Hashtag be a hero. Hashtag how can you not? Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Minister, I know we can all do more as individuals to encourage more Indians to register online at beadonor.ca. Donor, be Make a power of attorney so that someone they trust will ensure their wishes are followed. But government has a responsibility too, and I'm convinced that our government can play a positive role in getting more Indians to register as donors. I would like to ask the Minister, through you, Speaker, what our government is doing to increase organ and tissue donation rates and decrease wait list time for patients awaiting life-saving transplants. Thank you, Minister. Uh, speaker, organ and tissue donation is one of the greatest gifts any, any person can give. One person's donation can save up to eight lives and help another 75 through tissue grafts. I'm proud to say that 2012-13 was a record year, 1,009 organ transplants in Ontario. 
63 per cent more than in 2003. And we've more than doubled the number of registered donors, Speaker. 2.8 million of us now are registered. But that's still less than one in four Ontarians. It's good progress, but it's not enough. The launch of BeADonor.ca has made it easier than ever for Ontarians to become donors. TGLN's Gift of Eight campaign increased registered donors in communities right across Ontario. And we now ask people in all service Ontario centres that they'd like Answer. to sign up for organ and tissue donation when they renew their driver's license or Ontario photo, photo cards. Together, we'll continue to register more Ontarians to be organ and tissue donors. Thank you. Question the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. Premier, yesterday I asked you how much of your taxpayer-funded salary uh, was used for, you know, during the working day was spent on your personal legal drama that's playing out here at Queen's Park. And yesterday you responded by telling me that you like to run. Well, we know that you like to run from scandals. We know you like to run from accountability. We know you like to run from the legacy of that premier that you idolized and sat next to for 10 years. Heck, this morning. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, this morning she even ran from very pointed questions directed at her from the member from Newmarket Aurora, but I digress. Since question. you wouldn't answer my question yesterday, I'll give you another shot. How many hours were taxpayers paying your salary Thank so you, you could deal with legal, legal lawyers? Thank you. Seated, please. Premier. Well, <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And the point that I was making yesterday was that I work full time every day for the people of this province, Mr. Speaker. I start early in the morning and I end late at night, Mr. Speaker, and I will continue to do that. I will continue to do that. And I will continue to push for debate that is rooted in fact, Mr. Speaker. That is what I will continue to push for. So I'll continue my schedule, Mr. Speaker, and I, I reiterate my offer. I didn't see you this morning at quarter to six, but I'd be happy to see you tomorrow morning. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier. I was busy on my elliptical machine myself, but uh, we all know that the Premier likes treating taxpayers like her own personal piggy Order. bank, and that's what got us into this mess in the first place. You think taxpayers are your own, for, your own ATM machine, but using taxpayer resources to deal with your personal legal problems. I don't uh, need the uh, member from Etobicoke North to help me, and I want the member, the Minister of Rural Affairs, to come to order. I want the member from Eglinton Lawrence to come to order, and I want the member, uh, the Minister of Energy, to come to order. Thank you, Speaker. They're getting quite a workout there this morning, aren't they? Um, they shouldn't be using taxpayer resources to deal with a very personal legal scandal. Question. And this is all about the gas plant scandal. They can't spin it anymore. Government resources are used to communicate it, publicize it, plan it. How many taxpayer dollars are you using you. on your own little legal Thank drama? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Seated, please. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, well, you know, I, I just want to be very, very clear with the member opposite and the people of the province. There are no tax dollars. There are no tax dollars being used, Mr. Speaker, in order to advance the legal case. Those, those bills are being paid by the Ontario Liberal Party, Mr. Speaker, and I would not use, I would not use tax dollars for that, for that purpose. But, Mr. Speaker, let's just understand what is at stake here. The political discourse in this province the from must Prince Edward Hastings. Be rooted Order, in fact, Mr. Speaker, Listen. and I do not take legal action lightly, Mr. Speaker. It is not something that is in my nature. It is not something that I am inclined to do. But it is very important to me that, as we discuss the issues in this province, Mr. Speaker, that we talk about facts and that we make. Stop, please. Stop the clock. The, uh, the Minister of Rural Affairs is warned. New question. The member from Welland. 
question is to the Premier. Recently, we learned that the Ontario Energy Board approved an application from Enbridge, Inc. for a 40 per cent increase to natural gas rates. Then we heard that the OEB refused a request from the Consumers' Council of Canada and from the Vulnerable Energies Consumer Coalition for a special session to review the impact of Enbridge's planned uh, rate hike. Even the OEB staff said the request was entirely in order. Why is the OEB refusing to hear from the consumers, and why were they so quick to grant this drastic increase in gas rate hikes? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, consumer groups who, inter who intervened in the process, Vulnerable Energy Consumers Coalition and Con Consumers Council of Canada, submitted that the board should consider approving the rates on an interim basis and allow more consideration for smoothing out over time, which is exactly what the OEB has done. Oh. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, my question is not about the smoothing. It's about the initial increase. My office has heard from many constituents, and they're worried about their future. With hydro rates set to increase by 45 per cent and unemployment rates in my riding the highest in the province, constituents are feeling squeezed. Jim Lemotang from Welland wrote to my office on March 30th to describe the impact of rising costs on families. I quote, the elderly couple that lives beside me are on a tight budget. They did not want to turn their heat up this winter due to the fact they couldn't afford it. They were bundled up with their jackets inside their home all winter. Did the OEB consider these families when they decided to approve a 40 per cent rate hike without asking Enbridge the hard questions to determine whether or not the rate was even justified? Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, I've heard the uh, members from the third party on occasion raise the question of uh, Enbridge's uh, gas uh, gas increases and other issues with respect to energy pricing, Mr. Speaker. But I have not heard them offer any solutions. I would like to know what solution you're offering. The implication, Mr. Speaker, the implication is, Mr. Speaker, that we should interfere with the uh, with the proceedings at the Ontario Energy Board, which would be totally, absolutely illegal and irregular, Mr. Speaker. In order to do that, Mr. Speaker, the the Ontario Energy Board's mandate is to look after the interests of the consumer. Humor. That's one of its main mandates, Mr. Speaker. It examines the issues, it rules on them, and it gives ra rational reasons for the decisions. Well, one of the uh, rational reasons, Mr. Speaker, is that year over year, energy answer. consumption has gone up by between 15 and 20 percent because of the nature of the winter, Mr. Speaker. They choose to totally ignore Thank that. You. Thank you. A new question. The member from um, Oak Ridge is Markham. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Rural Affairs. Minister, Ontario's economic landscape is changing. Ontario's small and rural communities are becoming more complex and diverse and face unique challenges when it comes to economic development and job growth. There are currently a number of programs designed to assist rural municipalities with these challenges, including the Southwestern Ontario Development Fund and Eastern Ontario Development Fund. While these programs address many important priorities, such as business development and innovation, there is always room to do more. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Rural Affairs, could the Minister please update the House on what our government is doing to strengthen rural economies? Thank you. The Minister of Rural Affairs. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I do appreciate the uh, fine question for the member from Oak Ridges of Markham. Mr. Speaker, as it all, creating jobs and growing the provinces, rural economy are key priorities for this government. This is where initiatives like the Rural Economic Development Program come into play. Red supports high-value, low-cost projects that build a foundation for economic growth. These projects show off the innovation and community partnerships, which are so important and emblematic of rural Ontario. Since 2003, through the Red Program, our government has invested $171 billion in 418 projects, which has generated over $1.2 billion in local economic activity. And more important, Mr. Speaker, 35,000 jobs. I know by working together, we could strengthen Answer. rural communities every day in Ontario. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that answer. I'm glad to hear that the Ontario government takes the economic needs of small and rural municipalities seriously. 
I have many small rural communities in my great riding of Oak Ridges Markham, and many have benefited from business retention and expansion projects in the past through the Rural Economic Development Program. However, my constituents would like to know even more about this program, what type of parameters are, or how they apply, all the details related to this particular program. So, Speaker, could you, through to the Minister, could the Minister please elaborate on what kinds of individual projects uh, the Rural Economic Development Program does support? Thank you, Thank Minister. You. Well, thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And on Monday, I was in the wonderful community of Stratford, Ontario, and I was in the company of a former very distinguished member, Hugh Edekoffer, who served so ably from 1967 to 1990, and the Speaker from 1985 to 1990. And he was there to celebrate with us, along with municipal leaders. $170,000 were investing in local projects, each geared to enhancing the local economy, creating jobs. First of all, I want to talk about a great one, the little community of Shakespeare. Shakespeare, a company there, has developed quality fertilizers, which is using the funds to promote its new product line of fertilizers made from recycled natural materials. An enormous breakthrough in the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, it's a perfect example of a unique project in rural Ontario, and it's worth investing in. Local projects like these funded through RED are all about key partnerships. By working with our rural partners, working with Thank minister you. leaders, working with the private sector, Thank you. we can do great things in rural. Your question, the member from Newmarket Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Earlier today, in this question period, I tabled our concern about an assistant deputy minister, Patricia Lee counseling staff to make a statement in a letter to Orange that was untrue, found to be so by their own counsel. Once the Premier has had an opportunity to consider the facts, and it is in fact proven that the Assistant Deputy Minister conducted herself in that way, I want to ask the Premier, what will the consequences be for that Assistant Deputy Minister? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you, Premier. The Minister of Health and Long-Term Care said that she would look into this issue, Mr. Speaker. She would uh, determine what the facts are, Mr. Speaker. She will do that, Mr. Speaker. And the member is asking me a hypothetical question about what might happen in the future. I do not have an answer to that question, Mr. Speaker, nor do I choose to answer hypothetical questions. The Minister of Health and Long-Term Care will look into the matter, and we will get the facts. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. There are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.